Badmi Club. The Badmi Club is very pleased to have Dr. John Niederhauser present the annual Badmi Club lecture. He is internationally known for the excellence of his studies in the diseases of potatoes and for his breeding, breeding of resistant varieties. He is equally renowned for his ability to convince farmers and bureaucrats alike to use the new discoveries which have enriched the lives of millions of hungry people. I am very pleased to introduce the 1990 World Food Prize recipient, distinguished scholar, extraordinary humanitarian, Mr. Potato, Dr. John Niederhauser. President Kiros, friends and colleagues, it is of course an honor for me to be here on this wonderful occasion to talk with you a little bit about some of the work which I, with the wonderful cooperation of hundreds of my colleagues around the world, have uh, done during the past 45 years. I will intend to discuss a little bit the history of the potato, then to discuss in a few words something about the present status of the potato in the world today, and to maybe make a few remarks about its potential in the future. And then, if time permits, and I do understand, uh, my hosts have told me that we are beginning a little late, but that time comes off my lecture time. So, we will, um, if I may, I think it would be a useful, perhaps just to give you a very brief resume of my uh, career, um, that is professional career after going to Mexico in 1947. I went there as a plant pathologist to work on corn, wheat, and beans. And then, unbeknownst to the Rockefeller Foundation, we, uh, the word is moonlighted, a potato program into existence. There were some very interesting facts which uh, surround this, but um, it is a a fact that we began a potato program in Mexico, and I want to emphasize it was a national potato program, and this grew into a regional potato program in Central America and in Latin America, South America, finally became an international potato program, and then culminated, you might say, in 1971 with the creation of the International Potato Center in Lima, Peru. This is the institutional development, and I, it will give me a great deal of pleasure if I can uh, illustrate some of this with some slides, uh, indicating some of what I consider to be the more salient points in this contribution, again, made by my colleagues with whom I have cooperated these many years. May we have the lights and uh, begin with the slides. First of all, I wish to call attention, could we focus that please? I don't see the, and also it is not complete, the picture. Oh yes, that's fine. I would like to present to you the wonderful companion that I have lived with for the past, how many years, Anne? But Mrs. Niederhauser, who has gone with me to many countries and has been a wonderful inspiration in all of the work that we have done. And if we, I, I know you'll give a chance to meet her after this brief uh, talk, but I want to call attention to the uh, wonderful life that we have shared together and all of the work that has been accomplished in many countries of the world. Here we have a map of the place of origin of the potato, the red, dark red color is indicating where the cultivated potato was native. The red stippled areas are where other wild species of potatoes occur in the world. 
This is the place of origin of the potato in the Peruvian, Bolivian Andes and fields of potatoes growing in that region. I think, however, you can already begin to see some of the stress on ground in the background where formerly potato fields were planted and today are very seriously affected by erosion. This is an example of the variation of the cultivated potato in the Andean region. You can see that there are many, many types, many of them selected by farmers themselves from the botanical seed which is segregating and giving this wide variation of phenotype. This is another picture in the Andean region showing how where the potatoes are grown. This is an altitude of anywhere between uh, 11 to 14,000 feet and where it provided the sustenance of many of uh, several civilizations including the Inca civilization which was in Peru and Bolivia at the time of the conquest in the early 1500s. I'm sorry if these are not quite clear. I, uh, can we, can, is there a way to focus this from here? Excuse me, I don't. Well, in any case, there we are. I, I'm sorry, I don't believe this is uh, quite large enough for a, a could we, perhaps we should move the, no, there we go, there, but it goes out of focus then. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I believe this is perhaps too small for reading near the back. It is only a, a, a graph to show. I will try to speak louder. Can I be heard at this time? But in the world potato production, it has remained fairly constant. It has grown somewhat in the 30 years between 48 and 1950, 1950 and 1984. However, that's the world production. But the important thing here is to notice that in the developing countries of the world, the area has more than doubled in this 30 year period. Production per hectare has more than doubled, has doubled, and total production is now four times what it was in the previous, in 1950. This is an example of very rapid growth of a major basic food crop and indicates some of the breakthroughs which have occurred in this part of the world. The potato was grown, say, in the uh, 30, 40 years ago, mainly in regions like this in Mexico at very high elevations or under irrigation. And this was done in these two zones primarily to escape a disease, late blight of potatoes. This is during the dry season, of course, requiring ir irrigation and at the very high elevations where it was too cold for the fungus. This is an example or a graph of how potato production, thanks to a Mexican national production program, produced more potatoes over this 30 year period. The red line indicates increasing production. The green line indicating increased productivity, which is a true measure of progress. And of course, the rather gradual increase in acreage, but most important is the increase in productivity to increase the total production in Mexico more than almost seven times during this period. Meanwhile, in many countries of the world, this is a picture in Sri Lanka, the potatoes being grown on a small scale by many, many farmers where they did not grow potatoes before. In many places, however, they were obliged either to grow it and this place, even though it is in a tropical area, growing during the dry season and with some help with water for its uh, successful growth. Then, of course, under irrigation in countries like Pakistan, uh, where it is, uh, uh, again, becoming more and more of a major food crop. And in the, in Nepal, and here is where some of the varieties that carry some resistance to late blight are now being grown, and it's been grown in, uh, very, in a very rapidly increasing rate amongst the people who live in the highlands. I must add here, however, that with the increasing population in this part of the world, it is putting more and more pressure on the land. 
And you cannot blame them, however, if they wish to grow a crop which will produce more per, per hectare of a food which they do need desperately. This is a market in Bangladesh, again a country where production has increased very rapidly. This again is a chart which I believe will be maybe difficult for you to read. I'm sorry, but in Bangladesh, I would just like to mention one fact, that production over this 30-year period increased from 250,000 tons to over 1 million tons, more than four times. India is, a, is in the middle line here, is a spectacular example. From, it increased from 1,500,000 tons to over 12,250,000 tons, putting India, I believe it is sixth largest potato producing country in the world. Mexico, of course, and Turkey are other examples of what was done. And I repeat again that these great breakthroughs in production were accomplished through national programs. This was not done through substituting for their own resources or personnel. One of the more important set of data, of course, involved the economics of marketing. And I, again, the, um, I'm sorry that the graph is such small figures, but this lists the various capitals of several parts of the world, Africa, as well as Asia. And you'll have to, if you can't read it, you'll take my word for it. It is comparing the relative price of potatoes to rice in 1950 and 1980. And you can see that the, the price of potatoes has, has approached or even gone below the price of rice in these areas, indicating that increased production has dropped the price to the very important consumer. This is to shift our attention to the potato late blight disease, and I would uh, speak for a few moments on that. This is an, a map of the occurrence in Europe in the year 1845 when the fungus spread from the Bel uh, area of Belgium during that summer in concentric circles and finally reached Ireland and caused there the terrible potato famine of 1845. In many parts of the world where they are growing the still susceptible varieties they still apply the fungicide where they are economically able to do it and where they can afford the fungicides. However, it is a rather uh, costly, uh, manpower-intensive in, in, uh, way to grow potatoes. This is the famous late blight itself on the leaf. For those who are not acquainted with it, it does in a given year of of a, of a great attack in what we like to call cool, wet seasons. Uh, this can destroy the foliage and destroy the power of the plant to produce a crop. It also affects the tubers, of course, and if they have serious late blight, many times a tuber crop will be seriously affected and sometimes a total loss. In Mexico, where I began to work in 1947, we did know that there were some wild species in such areas as near this wonderful volcano near Mexico City, Popocatépetl. And in the woods here we do find wild potato species which are resistant to this fungus. I might point out here that this is the place of origin of this fungus, Phytophthora infestans, and the wild species in this area are the remnants of an original population and these are the resistant remnants from that population. All of these species in this area carry a tolerance to a high degree of resistance to this disease. This is an example of the leaf of a, one of those species, Selenum demissum. It shows, however, that it is not immune. And I might add here that we have never found a tuber-bearing wild potato species that is immune to Phytophthora infestans, the fungus, in Mexico its place of origin. This is the difference between two, a susceptible on the right and a resistant plant in a breeding program illustrating that under Mexican conditions you can find plants such as these which are resistant. 
They are then, this is the kind of resistance, and you can compare it to the lesion which we saw a while ago. It is necrotic, there's very little sporulation, and this is the kind of durable field resistance which we are searching in this food crop. In the early yield trials, and this is about as spectacular a result as you can get, these are in six row plots, and you can see here the resistance selections from this Mexican program. The Czech variety is planted in these apparently vacant spaces, but the variety alpha, one of the more resistant European cultivars, was used in Mexico as a Czech plot. The plants have been destroyed, and if you can see the resistant remains of those Czech plants. In other words, you do have a very, um, a very definite difference in resistance to this disease in central Mexico. The yields are obviously quite different. In the upper level, we have the, resist the yield from a resistant cultivar in Mexico and the yield of the susceptible alpha used as a check. These are the same varieties in Mexico under multiplication, and I like to, I did not realize it at the time when this picture was taken, but you can see in the early afternoon, the clouds assembling, and these, they will move over and give you the very important rains which are necessary for the daily attack by this fungus in the field in, this, in the Valley of Toluca. These varieties, the first year or two, were distributed to farmers in Mexico, and they grew them successfully. However, many neighbors that they had, and even people from other valleys in, 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 the, in central Mexico, would see these and would go to the market, buy some potatoes, and plant them, believing that they could now grow potatoes. They were several, uh, oh, I'd say very unfortunate circumstances where they lost their crop, because they did plant the local varieties. So as, a, as an extension technique, the farmers who grew them and were able to receive seed of these new varieties at that time were obliged to grow the field of the resistant potato, but they, they were obliged to grow one row down the middle of the variety alpha, which was susceptible. This then would show the casual observer to the field that he had to plant the resistant potato on either side, and this is the central row would show what would happen if he grew the old cultivar. This is the client for this program. And today, in the state of Michoacan, and in the state of Guerrero, in Mexico, in the highland regions, there are thousands of small farmers who are growing these resistant potatoes with no spray and getting a satisfactory or high yield of an important new food. The statistics for this production in Mexico, unfortunately, go unrecognized by the statisticians. They have not entered the national data. However, it makes no, no importance to these people who are growing and distributing this seed from neighbor to neighbor during the past 20 years. A similar story can be told for the Philippines, for Nepal, and uh, certainly those countries and a few other countries where they have been introduced. I would like to mention at this time several new strategies. I hope you will excuse the, uh, uh, the Spanish for this, but I think we can translate it. This was done deliberately for our president, Quiroz, so there would be no confusion. <laughs> These are new strategies in agricultural development. I will mention first Preco-DEPA. We are trying to use, of course, the, the technologies which have been advanced in these countries. And I would like to mention these because they represent a new strategy for agricultural development during the past 12 to 15 years. Preco-DEPA was established in 1978 after a meeting in Guatemala of representatives from six Central American countries with Mexico and the International Potato Center attending. They identified the limiting factors in potato production in each of their countries. And where this limiting factor was shared by two or more countries, one of those countries was appointed to be the regional leader for solving this limiting factor. This was done because of the scarce resources. 
that existed in those countries for working on potatoes. It was not an important crop in many of these countries, and they could not afford to have a complete potato program. As a result, it was moving very slowly in expanding its, its exp importance in these countries. However, with Precodepa, with the emphasis, for instance, on blight resistance and on seed production in Mexico, in Guatemala, on what we call rustic storage, allowing the subsistence farmer to keep his crop for several weeks and not be forced to sell it immediately. In Costa Rica, the work on bacteriosis, which is bacterial diseases of the potato, in Panama, on nematode diseases, and so on. Each of those countries developed a program of excellence which was available to each of the collaborating countries. If the International Potato Center, with its fine personnel and, and uh, research, wanted to do something about rustic storage, they did it through the national program in Guatemala. As a result, there was one regional potato development program that has proven highly successful over the past 12 years. It is financed by the Swiss for its regional dimensions and represents a new strategy in, in development which is now being copied in many regions of the world and hopefully will be extended to other food crops in this part of the world. The Swiss have identified it as the most cost-effective potato development program or crop development program that they sponsor anywhere in the world. I might emphasize that it is the scientists that participate in this program that determine the priorities. They are given a budget, a total amount, and they set up, they divide the budget amongst themselves in accordance with their regional priorities. The next new strategy is one which is finally set up. It's called with the wonderful Latin acronym Picti Papa. It's the second here. It is on the late blight disease and it represents a new strategy in that Mexico, a third world country, is the international base for this research program. It was established in August of 1990, a little over two months ago, with representatives from Poland, the Netherlands, Canada, United States, Mexico, and the International Potato Center cooperating in planning this new uh, research project. They were embarking on a system or a plan whereby the highly resistant Mexican varieties can be distributed to third world countries, developing countries throughout the world. And believe it or not, there's a tremendous interest in Europe in this because of a recent change in the late blight fungus population in those countries. And they're very worried, worried and are self-interested, if you wish, in cooperating here and sharing the wonderful uh, institutions and personnel that they have with their colleagues in developing countries. These projects that are being established right now and financed, partially financed already, and will be financed within the next six months are of mutual interest to the collaborating countries. This is a picture of the germplasm bank of these Mexican selections. There are now some 24 of them, which are ready for distribution throughout the world, can be grown without spray. I believe that they represent the possibility of a new green revolution, and in a very interesting sense, could be a very important new green revolution because they will produce more food in countries of the developing world while fewer chemicals are used. I might add here that the potato as a food crop receives more chemicals, total chemicals, in the world today than any other food crop we grow. And here is a move to help solve that important problem with such implications for keeping our environment in uh, the quality of our environment. This is a graph merely showing potato consumption in the world. I will only say that the, the world potato consumption average is about 35 kilos per person per year. However, that is very much skewed in the direction of Eastern Europe, Europe and the Soviet Union. I'm reading the, the graphs down from left to right. Western Europe, North America, Oceania, which really means Australia and New Zealand, 
And finally, in countries of the developing world, it is still very low. Latin America, Asia, and Africa. However, we do know that the potato is a very nutritious food. Here is a graph. I'm sorry it is so small this evening, but in the top is, is the line indicating the production of nutrients per hectare in the world today. The black bar represents potatoes. The others are maize, wheat, and rice. And I think you can see that the potato produce production per hectare in the world today is significantly higher than that of the grains. Curiously enough, in Latin America, the place of origin of the potato is the one place where the potato is struggling. But in the other places, in the Middle East, in Asia, even in Africa, even though yields are lower, the potato is very significant in the productions of calories, protein, iron, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, and of course ascorbic acid, which is, is unique. This does indicate a more nutritious food that can be grown in small areas for feeding the people of these parts of the world. Looking ahead, we do know that we are faced with an increasing problem of population stabilization. Today, we have five billion people, more than five billion people on Earth. And by the end of this century, in 10 years, at the beginning of the next millennium, there will be over six billion. It is predicted, using United Nations figures, that population stabilization can be reached and hopefully, probably will be reached approximately in the year 2100 with a total world population estimated to reach 12 billion. If this is done, we do have a tremendous challenge in the world today to feed this population. I will only add a few more words to point out that this challenge today of trying to feed this population presents a tremendous uh, uh, task for not only our leaders who must have the determination and the wisdom to propose how to go about feeding this population, but also the conviction of their constituencies that it is a serious problem. We do have throughout the world, of course, the problem of food distribution as well. And it is so contradictory to know today that we have more food in the world today than ever in history. Asian countries such as China and India have stored grain. And our own beloved country, one of the, the greatest food production countries of the world, we have a surprising number of hungry people in our country. The whole problem of distribution is one that warrants our most careful attention. I think we're living in one of the most exciting periods of, the, of uh, history, perhaps, in recognizing that if we're not, that we must have what we'll call a world community of nations. And as we approach the biologic limits of what our planet can produce, we must do it very carefully and utilize all the resources in an effort to produce this food without hurting or further deterioration of the environment. At this moment, I would like to proceed to another project for a few moments. I believe we do have sufficient time. And this is to indicate a look at the future. And very briefly, I'd like to describe to you what is called the Biosphere 2 project, some 40 kilometers northwest of Tucson, in which Here's a model of this biosphere that is being built, and it is with a, it is with a uh, metal alloy underneath. It is of glass and plastic. It will be hermetically sealed, possibly for entry by eight persons this December. It may be delayed a few months, and they will live inside this biosphere for two years. 
In front here, we see four deliberately for experimental purposes or, or for demonstration purposes, four different environments. Here is a desert, a ocean, a savanna, and a rainforest to examine how life can be and, uh, be, uh, and all materials can be completely recy recycled in each of the environments. Where the, this upper part here is what is called the uh, intensive agriculture, and back of it, the building where the laboratories and dormitories for the eight biospherians are built. This is the actual construction last spring of this biosphere. And here, interestingly enough, is just a, it's a very simple graph of what we will call, in the case of food, the production biomass on the left. Then it is, some of it, of course, will go immediately to what they call waste down below. Some of it, of course, then is processed for human consumption and goes over to human consumption. And also in the method of in processing, some goes to waste and some of you after human consumption, it also goes to waste in this closed environment. But the most important arrow here of all is the one in red where the waste returns to the production biomass. This is oversimplifying the formula, but there are literally dozens of different ways of going about this and realizing this, uh, making this graph effective. I here are the criteria for selection of the food plants they intend to grow in there. First of all, production potential, calories per square meter per day. Second, the nutritive value of that food product. Third, the proportion of the biomass that is digestible, that is they don't want a plant that gives, like a nut tree, is not being included. Four, the ease of preparation or processing, which is very important to the biospherians. Five, the palatability as a part of a daily diet. The foods cannot be too exotic. Six, the area needed for cultivation, which is related to the production potential. And seven, the ease of propagation. The plants and animals that are being included, uh, these are some of them, not all of them. On plants, wheat, rice, the potato, sweet potato, peanut, soybean, sugar beet, and lettuce. Of the animals, there's this small goat, chickens, rabbits, fish, and more recently, a very small Asian pig. This is an example of the technology being used in the biosphere. These are some of the food production tanks. At the close end here, you can see a fish, tilapia. It's separated from some, by some screens, which are inoculated with three species of bacteria, nitrosomonas, azotobacter, and I forgot the third one. But as it is, as the ammonia effluent, it goes through those screens, is converted into nitrates, and you can grow lettuce there, or in most cases, they have grown rice. When that crop is then harvested, if there's any extra organic matter, the roots, and in the case of rice, the straw, that is chopped up and fed back to the tilapia. And you have, in essence, a circular food production system. This is the way tomatoes are grown. Some of you have seen in the Epcot display in the Disney World in Orlando, Florida, this way of growing tomatoes. They're hung by a collar from a revolving uh, line. They pass through, at one point, a small little uh, Old canvas tunnel where the roots are sprayed with nutrient solution and they continue on their way. No soil involved. You get some beautiful tomatoes from these crops. This is the way lettuce is grown. Nutrients are sprayed inside that plastic frame and the plants grow. Uh, it takes, it is a matter of four to at the most five weeks when you can get a crop of lettuce. This is the roots uh, exposed on the inside where they're sprayed. The potato is grown in these frames. We're now growing them either two or three levels. They're planted, planted in the first frame, and as they come through the ground, they place a second frame on, cover it with a little soil, and keep it going until it has reached a, a fine plant on the top, 
and the potatoes are produced in the column. This is done, of course, to increase the calories per square meter per day, which is one of the criteria for choosing this plant. This is an example of the production in one of these uh, little uh, frames. And just an example of the total yield, 51 grams per square meter per day, which has broken a world record, we understand, and is certainly the most productive of the, of the food crops which we, with which we have experimented. These are the advantages of the potato as a food crop in space, the high yield potential, the excellent carbohydrate, protein, and vitamin source, high proportion of edible biomass, that is, you can eat all of the tubers, and the vines, of course, go back either as a, can be used as a food for some of the animals, or go back and be recycled. They're easy to prepare for eating, they're widely accepted as a daily food, they're adaptable to cultivation in concentrated areas, the very simple methods of propagation, as you potato farmers know, the wide variety of cultivars available, and there's an extensive production technology available for it to improve yields. Here's an example. I'm afraid this, yes, this is correct. This is a picture of a space vehicle, the kind that might be used in about, I'd say, close to 20 years from now, in the year 2010 or 2015, on the project for a voyage to Mars. This trip will take nine months to go and nine months to return. During this time, these travelers in space will be required to produce their own food. And some of the principles under which this will be done are being established in this biosphere. We must remember, however, that in space, there is not only a 24-hour day, but there are, there's no gravity. So in some of these cylinders, and this is being done at uh, uh, Canaveral in Florida, Cape Canaveral, as well as in Arizona. Some of these are being grown in these cylinders which are spun to provide a centrifugal force. And so the plant will grow with the apex or the growing point coming in and the roots growing out in response to the geotropism and the negative geotropism that we all recognize in the growing plant. This is an example of where they might land. Uh, this happens to be, of course, from the moon, looking back at the planet Earth. And I mention this, this last part only as an example of what can be done in space. And hopefully, we'll be learning from this experiment, if you wish, on how to produce food, completely recycle, what we are producing to restore the soils and the environment in a sustainable agriculture and still produce enough food for not only the population, in this case of a biosphere two, but on biosphere one, which is the planet Earth. If we can do this, if we can meet this challenge, the promise for a world truly at peace can be realized. Thank you very much.